This is the Houndsman XP Podcast. Good dog, get that bear. Get that bear in here. The original podcast for the complete Houndsman. The podcast that represents our lifestyle of extreme performance. Get up there! Yeah! 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 Good boy! Good boy, Ranger! Uniting houndsmen across the globe, from east to west, north to south. You know, if you're going to catch a cat or a lion, you know, you have to have teamwork. We take you to the wildest places on earth. Yeah, so how many days how many days a week do you spend in the As much as I can to be honest with you. Any time that I get I'm I'm out there. Join us for every heart pounding adventure on Houndsman XP. I'll tell you like I tell everyone else, I'm gonna hunt whether you're here or not, so you might as well be here. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to the Houndsman XP Podcast. I hope you all had a great week. And in many parts of the country, it is starting to become spring. And I love spring. It's uh, turkeys gobbling and and warmer days and cool nights. And it's like the uh, rebirth of the planet Earth. So I get kind of wound up about spring. I even start thinking about hunting you know, coon dogs in the evenings. I really like hunting during the springtime and getting out there and enjoying those evenings. Those first nights when those peepers start jumping out there and it just, I don't know, it just speaks to my soul. But anyway, I want to tell you about our podcast this week. I've got Becky Dwyer on the podcast. She's going to talk to us about socialization and talk about things that you can do to get your pup off to a very good and solid start and increase your success of having a hound not only that performs well, but also one that you can tolerate and will give you many years of good solid service. Becky is a professional dog trainer and She has worked as a bird dog trainer in Louisiana and Texas and worked all over the country as a dog trainer. She's one of those people that when you see her posting on social media, you read her posts because she's bringing you valid information and stuff that is really going to enhance your ability to train pups. And that's what this is all about, is about laying down that foundation. Everything in dog training is a... Uh, building block process and you can't build it from a narrow base and then expect a wide base you've got to establish that wide base in the beginning and Becky is going to walk us through all of that and and give us some insight on that you've also heard her husband Cleve Dwyer on this podcast and they operate Bull Creek Lion Hunts in northern Nevada and check them out on social media heck book a lion hunt with them You ought to see some of the pictures of the toms that they're taking up there in northern Nevada. They are some toads. All right, so I've got Becky Dwyer on the line, and we are going to talk about socialization in puppies and how to avoid hard-headed dogs and... Becky's title on the screen is Becky Dwyer Beagle Queen. And any person that can love a beagle as much as you do has dealt with hard heads. And how 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 do you how do you get into beagles? That is a fact. I saw the option for pronouns when I logged into the podcast and said, "Well, that's the best pronoun I've seen." So, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny when I was a kid. I I wanted hounds and beagles forever and I'd look on the back of the retriever field trial news and that was back when Purina had all their champions from all the different categories listed and I just beagle fever bit me I guess and ever since then I've wanted them and 
I remember there was a time where Cleve and I were, you know, it was pretty good struggle trying to make things work. And I paid for a couple of beagle pups and had them shipped out from Kentucky. And I've been slowly losing my sanity ever since. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. was it? How, I gotta, I gotta ask you, how was that transition from the, the, uh, traditional dry ground lion hound to, Hey honey, I think we ought to add some beagle to this line. <laughs> how did that conversation go? Well, uh, you know, Cleve really does kind of put me on a pedestal and to the poor man's detriment, he really can't tell me no. So I generally try not to take too much advantage of it, but unless beagles are involved and then, you know, all's fair in love and war. So right. we were talking about it and he's like, well, tell me about them. I've never been around them. And I think the first thing I said was they are extremely intelligent. They're, they're border collie smart, but they are super trail oriented they're also mischievous they are a pain in the neck on a daily basis just living with them but they're just I, I like their build I think they would bring a lot to the table and he figured it was probably easier to go along with it than than argue with me at the time and now here we are we were talking about it yesterday uh I think we've only got five dogs now that don't have some form of beagle in them whether it's purebred or down to a 32nd and so far we're we're pretty tickled with what we've been finding. No doubt. No doubt. So one of the things that we we're going to talk about today, um, that we were talking about previously was, you know, having hard headed dogs and how that can, uh, not only is it extremely frustrating to have a dog that we perceive as being hard headed, but it also stymies their development, their performance and things like that. So, what were you thinking about on that, that talking point, Becky? Um, I think that's where it comes down to where a handler can really affect a dog. If you've got a dog that's not, not necessarily hard headed, but not necessarily soft, he's, he's going to react to the way you handle him. You know, if you're, if you're loud, if you're very animated, if you're say a yeller, you know, get on over here and, kind of um I don't want to say intrusive but you're, you're a loud person that dog is going to rise to your level of pressure you know if I holler at him once I'm gonna to have to holler at him twice and louder next time I want a dog that I can amp down you know I've got one dog that all I have to do is say his name and I have to get he's an extremely odd dog he's extremely sensitive I have to almost whisper and he will he's good to go if I holler he borderline mentally shuts down and it's, I've never whipped on him. I've never, you know, never had any challenges that way. It's just very much so his temperament and his working level and, and the goal and the finesse of dog training is to always be lowering that threshold and that, that level of, of pressure needed, but you still want to get more response with less pressure. Sure. No, no doubt about that. And, and one of the things, this is a funny story. Uh, you bring up, if you have to tell them once, if you, if you're in the habit of yelling and putting that constant pressure on them, a dog will learn that they don't have to listen until you say it the third or fourth time, <laughs> you know, and it's kinda... I, I, I've told this story before maybe, but I was in a parenting class before our first child was born, our daughter and, um, uh, typical new parents, my wife is like, Hey, I think we should go to this parenting class. It's being put on by the church. And, um, all these, all these expecting parents were sitting around and they were talking about how they were going to do this and how they were going to do that and, and all that stuff. And I was just sitting there listening and our associate pastor looked at me and he says, Chris, you've been pretty quiet. What do you think? And I said, well, it sounds to me like raising kids is a lot like raising dogs. You, you show them what you want, you tell them what you want, and then you enforce good behavior and you correct the bad behavior. And you would have thought that I was the world's biggest villain in the place because all these expecting mothers were like, oh, my gosh, you're, you are comparing my baby to a dog, you know. <laughs> but I have found the similarities there for, for both. Absolutely. It's funny you say that. I was going to say it reminds me, you know, you're out shopping or something and you hear – 
someone uh, telling their kid to cut it out five or six times, then you hear them go, I'm not going to tell you again. And I, I, I may or may not have been known to occasionally go, bet you will. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And I see the same thing with, with, and I've been guilty of this myself. So if you've ever hunted with me, you've probably seen me yell at my dogs. So don't think I'm talking to you from, from, uh, you know, an innocent, innocent background or even have to check myself now, but it's just so annoying, uh, when people nag their dogs, you know, get over here, come here, come on. I want you to come over here now, come on. Now. And, you know, and they just escalate until it's like, dude, just chill, you know, Absolutely. It's and that's what you're, that's what you're talking hard headed, right? Yeah. Oftentimes, um, like, yeah, you making them that way. You could basically, you know, it's no different than sitting there and riding a horse or a mule and you're constantly bumping them with your legs while their sides go dead. Same thing with her ears. If you tell them, you know, they're like, all right, well, I don't have to listen until the 16th time he calls me for right. me. I mean, are there times where I'll raise my voice because it needs to happen? Absolutely. But that's not the operating level for me. It's a whole lot easier to say it one time and then hit a tone button. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the same way I think we communicate as people too. Some of the most effective communicators I knew were very calm. They were very controlled. And I worked with guys like this, that when they got to that high level, then you knew shit was about to get real because they never were there until they needed to be there. And that was, so, that was always so effective, you know, mm -hmm. and it, I was it makes... not that, I was not that good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a little lag, so I'm not meaning to cut you off. Um, yeah, and you know, That's it right. makes a difference for the dog because the dog knows what to expect versus, well, you know, he hollered at me for 20 minutes trying to get me to come in the other day. Today, he hollered at me for three and was leaning on the, the e-collar button. That's not fair to the dog. Your dog cannot reason. They need, you know, they don't know you're in, I mean, they know you're in a bad mood or whatever. They don't know you're short on time. All they know is what they know. So make it consistent. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's talk about establishing some good habits before they become a problem. Let's start there. And I think uh, one of the places that we can talk about, uh, hopefully this will be helpful for people who get dogs, uh, puppies from breeders, but also help some breeders do some things before they get that puppy in the consumer or the hunter's hands that they can start doing to make their puppies a higher quality um, cause personally the litters that I have raised and, and got out there to the public, you know, I try to get them the best quality puppy that they can possibly get. And then uh, hopefully they take that puppy and build on what I do. And because as a breeder, I don't want two out of 10 puppies turning out. I want eight, at eight out of 10 or 10 out of 10 turning out. And I think this could be helpful for people that are raising puppies, not only for themselves, but also that want to establish a good, good name for themselves as uh, breeders and people that are sought after for having high quality puppies. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think if you really like a dog and you want to make sure that that dog is going to be fine his entire life, say, you know, catastrophe hits, medical illness, and you need to get rid of your dogs. The best thing you can do for that dog is to make sure he's liked wherever he goes, wherever he ends up. And the way to do that is to put manners on him. And I'm not talking, there's a difference between obedience and manners. They are not the same thing. A dog can listen to every command and still be a butthead to live with. You know, I don't have a lot of commands on my dogs. For the most part, come and sit. But they are mannered. And they... They respond to situations without me having to tell them what to do in an appropriate way. Most of the time, I have the few that make my <laughs> eyes twitch, but most of the time I can trust them to respond appropriately. Exactly. I've seen that myself. You know, you, you have dogs that when you're there, they're angels, but as soon as you turn their back, they've got their head buried in the trash can. They're getting on the counters. They're, you know, they're chewing up a shoe. They're doing all of these other things. The only thing they, I agree with you hundred percent, obedience training and good manners are completely different. So let's dive into how we start establishing that. Do you start at the day the puppies are born? Do you have a, a certain date that, when does this begin for you, Becky? 
So the first day I just, I let, you know, and usually if I can be, I'm, I'm present, you know, this last litter, she whelped right in the middle of the afternoon and she was pretty upset. I think she's a little low on calcium. Um, a lot of bitches, if they're low on calcium, they'll be very anxious. They'll be worried back and forth, constantly messing with the pups. Um, that's just some of the symptoms. So we were there and, um, if I can, I tend to like to cut the umbilical cord, especially if a, if a bitch is nervous, that way you have a lesser chance of an umbilical hernia. Um, so I was pretty involved in this one and she was fine with it. So that's fine. But after that, I let them settle in, make sure everybody's nursing, gaining dry. She's taking care of them and then just leave her be to settle in. Now day two comes along. Mm -hmm. I use a program. Some people call it uh, ENS, early neurological stimulation, the super dog program. It goes by several names. The military first started it. They have since stopped using it. Um, they didn't find scientific backing that they were looking for behind it. It doesn't take that long for me to do. And I really like the results that I've seen from it, especially with litters that haven't had it and litters that have. So I figured, you know what, if it doesn't do anything, okay, it takes me five minutes a day. And from what mm -hmm. I have seen, it does do something. Um, and basically what it does is it subconsciously puts stressors on the puppy, both physically and mentally. And it's just, you do, I think it's, I'd have to go back and count. I know the steps, but I haven't counted how many there are. Um, but each step you do for two to three to five seconds a day, and you do it once a day. And it's, you know, you've got stimulation where you are holding the puppy with his head straight up above his tail, his tail straight up above his head. They're being held on their backs. You're tickling their toes with a Q-tip or cotton ball. You're putting them on a washcloth that's been in a fridge for five minutes for thermal stressors. Um, and the claim is that it helps build a stronger cardiovascular system. They are more resistant to thermal stress, to environmental stress. Their adrenal glands, which help regulate hormones and stress levels, are strengthened. And from what I've seen, um, the pups that come out of it are are pretty bulletproof, we can say, as far as stress goes. Um, they're very tolerant to physical discomfort. I just really like what I've seen. So it starts from there, and then you do that through day 16. And then at that point, I mean day 16 to when they've got their, their eyes really open and they're moving around. There's not a ton you can do, but I am getting them used to being handled, getting them used to my smell, voices, loud noises, um, just kind of the basic stuff. And then once they start being a little more mentally cognizant, I start going into the day-to-day -day living manners. So, so what's it called again? Is it called INS? Uh, ENS. It's early neurological, ENS. Yeah, early neurological early. stimulation. And and where can people find more information about that part of the program that you're using? That's the first question I have. I've got a couple about ENS specifically. Okay. Um, so if you just Google early neurological stimulation or the super dog program, super puppy program, there are a ton of articles that come up on it from other breeders, from um, a scientific standpoint. There's You can really go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. And then you have raised bird dogs and performance labs, all these things for your whole life. Now you're working with hounds and you're working with the, the lion hounds that you and Cleaver breed, you know, breeding for out there. What kind of comparisons can you make between the puppies that have been exposed to ENS and, and puppies that you raised that were not? Um, I have found them to be just mentally tougher in an aspect of they can power through stuff. If that, you know, something uncomfortable, if they're, you know, I had a dog that laid his chest open on running through some barbed wire and I didn't even know it. He'd come running up and I just went to go pat him on the chest and I come out and my hands full of blood. I grab him and flip him up and look at him and he's just sitting there happier in hell. Like he never knew anything was going on. Um, you know, if you need to staple or stitch, they're not as dramatic, I guess you could say um, about certain things. I found them to be very tolerant to 
colder temperatures. They just seem to be more of a roll with the punches kind of dog. Like I've got, I've got one plot hound here that every time I try to put, he knows what's coming. Every time, every time they come out of the kennel, uh, we're going hunting. They sit in front of their kennel door. I collar them up and, you know, I just kick them by me and let them go do. I've got one that is hard to put a collar on. He's just so wound up and things like that. And then some of the other pups that, and I did not raise him from a puppy. I got him when he was a year and a half old. So is that some of the, just the basic handling stuff that you have seen where it's made a difference in, in dogs that were raised this way versus dogs that weren't? Um, I don't attribute that stuff as much to the ENS because all of that is subconscious. I think the daily handling stuff tends to come down to the conscious stuff more. So say from four or five weeks on, from the time they have an attention span, basically more than a goldfish, uh, to be able to learn that stuff. Now I have some that are hard, you know, every dog has its quirks and there's some stuff yeah. that people are going to tolerate. There's some stuff that people who have extremely obedient hounds tolerate that. I'm like, that would drive me up a wall. And then I know, you know, for me, it's not a big deal if my dogs tend to want to blow through the dog box door a bit, you know, I just get back and, and jiggle the door a little bit and they pop back. That's just not something that aggravates me personally. I've had dogs that'll sit and wait till you call their name. It's just not something that, mm -hmm. that aggravates me personally, but something like, uh, marking and doing scratching kickbacks. Uh, uh, and you better not do it. If I call you, if you're on your way to me and you stop and do that, we are going to have a safety meeting. Let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> when you're on my time, you're on my time. And you don't need to yeah. be worrying about letting everybody know you were here and that you think you're silly badass. Yeah. Well, we've, uh, is there anything else you want? It, let's, let's, let's move on to exposure and, you know, your, your talking point here of let them learn. That's one of the things that we also talked about in the aggression podcast and Heath called it self-discovery, you know, where dogs, learn on their own, mm -hmm. expand on, on your experience with that as well. A dog can teach himself to be a dog a whole lot better than I can, especially with other dogs. You know, I'm, I'm really blessed to have a place where my nearest neighbor, uh, is a mile away and we're surrounded by just vacant rangeland. Um, so I can really just kind of kick the door open and keep an eye on them but let them go. And when they're little, is that nerve wracking? Yeah, of course it is. I got coyotes and hawks and badger holes and whatever else. I mean, stuff can happen, but dogs can't live in, in glass houses. And I want them to go out and, and explore and figure things out on their own and gain self-confidence without having to rely on me. Now, at the same time, by learning to learn, I also want them to be exposed to situations where I help them through things, you know, like I, uh, I've got a little pool that we put in for the dogs. So when they're all turned loose during the day and they're, you know, we're working around the place, they're running around, they're going out trailing rabbits and chipmunks and lizards and they come back and jump in the pool. I will take those puppies at I don't know, six or seven weeks, five weeks, sometimes just depends on the pups and put them in that pool. Now, granted, it's very gently. It's when the water is warm. The, the, the first exposure to everything is the most important in reality. That's what forms, in my opinion, the first impression. And we know how hard first impressions can be to overcome. And generally, they will freak out. Oh, my God, it's wet. I don't like this. I want to get out. And they're clawing and scratching. And I'm right. still holding on to them and supporting them. You know, but I'll slowly move them over to the ladder. And I'll just support them while they climb out of the ladder. And I want them to get in the habit of saying, okay, this is uncomfortable. This might be a little scary. I'm going to think my way through it instead of just reacting and freaking out. That could get a dog killed on a mountain. You know, if he's up on a ledge or something and he's all of a sudden realizing what's going on, it's not going to hurt him to take a half a second and figure something out versus just yeah. running around like a chicken with his head cut off. So, so let's talk about the person that doesn't have the same setup that you have, you know, with, with the ability to kick the kennel door open and let dogs run. I've got the same, um, situation here, but a lot of houndsmen and a lot of our listeners, um, may not have the benefit, those benefits. So, so what are some things that they can be doing with their puppies 
if they're in a suburban setting or, you know, close by neighbors and they want to be good neighbors as well. How can a, how can a person take that puppy out and get exposure for them? Absolutely. Um, you know, and it's tough with puppies that are at that, you know, eight to 12 week age, um, depending on your vaccination status, eight to 16 weeks, because you don't want to be taking them into pet smart where every Tom, Dick and Harry is taking their dog that who knows what they're going to be exposed to. Um, you know, if you've got a, a place by you, even if it's just a wooded area that not a lot of people go, you don't, you, you dang sure don't want to take them to a dog park or anything anything <laughs> like that for, for multiple reasons. Uh, you know, disease ridden dog fight club doesn't sound very exactly. nice as dog park does, <laughs> but <laughs> if you, you know, if you've got a, an open cornfield or something, just take that pup out and, and let them use their nose. Let them, let them go out and explore a little bit. Obviously keep an eye on them, you know, depending on your puppy and that puppy's temperament, if the puppy is a little more reserved, or a little less bold, take an older dog that that puppy's been exposed to. And that older dog will show him, hey, this is all right. Here's what we do. He'll give him some confidence. If you've got a puppy mm-hmm. that's very bold and very confident, take him by himself. It's it's okay. You know, I want my puppies to be oftentimes just over their threshold of comfort, but not enough to set them back. Enough that, you know, you know, uh, what's the saying that comfort zones kill growth. But at the same yeah. time, I don't want to overwhelm them so much. So once they are say overstimulated a little bit, I'm going to go back to something they know. I want that dog to always be successful. I want them to always be wanting more. I don't want to overwhelm them to the point that they're like, I, I don't want anything to do with this. This is too much. And that's where it really helps to be able to read your puppies and read your dogs and see how they're reacting to the environment or to situations. Yeah, I can tell you an experience I had with a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Uh, not a hound, obviously, but I still want my hounds to be comfortable around water as well. But when this when this Chesapeake Bay Retriever was, you know, 12 to 16 weeks old, you would think a dog that's bred for water. And I take him to a, a road that was flooded, uh, and you could just gradually walk in, and this pup didn't want to come in the water. And so I just started walking away from him and he eventually came in the water and then he got up on a stump and was sitting there whining and, and completely stressed out. And I let my ego get in the way and think, well, buddy, you're going to have to figure it out. You're going to spend the rest of your life doing this. So you're going to have to figure that out. But you mentioned, you know, seeing that stress and overstimulation. And, and that's exactly what I did to this dog. It took me several weeks, you know, well on a dog that's bred for this. And because of the way I handled that particular situation, I set them back to, you know, a, a water avoidance type behavior. And I've, I've done the same thing with, with hound pups, uh, in the past. And, and man, if I just slow down a little bit and recognize that I'm overstimulating, and and giving them a break and let them be successful so what are some signs that you see that are takeaways for people that are that are uh raising these hound puppies that they can say hey i'm right there on that threshold i don't want to take it much beyond this absolutely and body language a lot of it you know if your pup has got his head down not not smelling but he's got his head down and his eyes are kind of darting around he's trying to make himself small um And avoidance type behaviors, you know, if the dog doesn't want to make eye contact, if the dog is yawning or I have a dog and it's funny, we were talking about it when he was growing up. And I I told Cleve, I said, watch, watch this dog we call Swagger. I said, watch him. Every time he is uncomfortable or he gets over an uncomfortable situation, he'll stop and itch his collar or some dogs will shake. And that's basically kind of like when you get out of a situation and you go, okay, it's a little bit of a release. Um, Right. You know, and oftentimes you'll see that after the dog has already been put through that stress. But if you watch, you'll see a dog start to get more hesitant. His his body language won't be happy and perky and jumping around. He'll be kind of acting like he's trying to find a way to leave the situation or to neutralize anything that might be observing him, if that makes sense. Like if you watch an older dog come up to a young pup and that pup will freeze and kind of put his head down. Um 
and he'll just stand there like, okay, I, I'm not a threat. I, I just want to get along. I don't want any trouble. Right. You'll see them do that environmentally also. Mm -hmm. And that's so where, do, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, where do you, where do you look at it that they're being uh, overstimulated to uh, balancing that out with, I don't want to let, let them get away with not obeying what I say. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Because I think a lot of times I look at this and I think, well, I don't want to let him get away with anything. So I'm going to go ahead and make him work through this. How do you make your puppies work through those situation without making them feel like that or make, I guess it's making me feel like I'm letting them get away with something. A lot of that is going to come, that's where you kind of come into the gray area. And I don't want anyone thinking, you know, oh, this is going to work for every pup. You have to really pay attention and, and know your pups um, and know your capabilities too. You know, there's times where our, you can do more damage to a dog doing something and going through the motions than you can leaving that dog for a day. Um, and that's where I think, okay, so let's say the dog can't handle, you know, he's too nervous to handle going out and swimming in the pond. Okay, let's get him amped up about some toys and running around and let's have him run through the puddle. You know, it's baby steps building up to that. And then, and, and that's just a, an example, you know, um, if it's something along the lines of he's really nervous around my big dogs that are, are rowdy and they're playing and barking. Okay, let's get an old dog that's going to basically ignore him. Puppies learn so much through observation. And if mm -hmm. I've found that puppies that are a little less sure of themselves, instead of jumping right in the middle of the fray, they're going to sit back and watch and they're going to observe until they're comfortable and then they're going to make a move. So basically just de-escalate the situation. You don't necessarily change the situation, but you back off the intensity of it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It does make sense. And that that's one of the things that I had to change in my training behavior it, it wasn't necessarily that it wasn't win or lose for me. It was win or lose for that puppy. And as the trainer, it's my responsibility to make sure that the puppy wins the, the situation they're in. Not that I get what I want. I, I ultimately will get what I want if I let them win. You know, it may not be the exact way that I want it done, but we let them win. And it's not about my ego. It's ab eventually about that, the performance of that puppy. Absolutely. You know, it kind of goes back to the Rex Carr saying a man's ego is a heavy burden for a dog to carry. And that's true. You know, if, if you think about it, especially let's say you go pick up your new puppy and you're excited, man, I can't wait to get working with him. And, and to break it down. And I guess to kind of a dramatized situation, Taking a puppy from his only home, his litter mates, his mom, and all of that to your new home would basically be the equivalent of us getting shanghaied and taken to another country where we don't speak the language. We don't, we can't communicate. We don't know anything. And we're just like, whoa, my whole world just got turned upside down and I don't know how I feel about it. Um, so, you know, and that's where I, I'm not a big treat pusher. I mean, I am and I'm not. I'm, I'm what you would call balanced. So I'm very for positive reinforcement and consequences. Now, when they're little, mm -hmm. the easiest way to keep them learning and interested in you because they have the attention span of a goldfish is treats. So I will get little cheap Oscar Mayer hot dogs and we call them puppy crack. You cut them up into little sections. And let me tell you, there is very few puppies that can turn that down. Uh, I currently have one right now, but that's a whole nother <laughs> Whole nother deal. Um, but it's real easy. And I want that puppy to be successful. So I will start on the easiest level of learning. So I'm going to teach him to sit before I teach him to lay down. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, or teach him to come um, and just really work with the pup. And I want to build their confidence so much. So, you know, and there, there tends to be a, a school of thought of two ways, I guess, that you notice more in hounds. It's either let them run around like absolute wild Indians until they're a year or a year and a half old and then drop the hammer on them. Or it's have them so obedient that they're nailed down and the dog doesn't necessarily free up 
as much. I, I want to be somewhere in the middle. I want them wild, but I don't want to run it around like an idiot either. I, I, I want to have them just on that line where they're independent and they they can think stuff through and do stuff on their own. But I can also get a hold of them and and they'll do what I need them to do. You know, I want a dog that's so confident that he thinks there's nothing he can't do, but he also needs to run it by by me in a way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I I had to change a lot of the things that I did. And it was from, I really made a lot more changes even after I started this podcast and hunting with people in the West. You know, um, Calvin, Calvin Redhouse was the first one that I hunted with. And seeing dogs with a bear treed or a lion, a lion treed, and I mean, just totally focused on that in him being able to yell break and every dog peels off that tree, crosses a Canyon and comes back to you. It would have taken us 45 minutes to get over there to him. It wasn't a cat. We were going to, we were, we weren't going to take a cat that day anyway. And him being able to have that recall was amazing to me. And I thought, man, there are better ways to do this, you know? And, and having that ability and all the dogs were extremely happy and you know, there's just better ways to do it. And from the mindset and then the way that I was training my hounds was, I don't want to see you again until I take you off the tree. And I found out that you can have both. You can mm -hmm. have a dog that when you unsnap them, they, they leave you like they're late for work. And when you need them back, you can tone them and bring them in you know, and, and they, you get the best of both worlds. Absolutely. And that, that also ensures, you know, just because something's going to work for you, it may not work for somebody else. And if you think, you know, if you think you may end up having somebody else handle that dog, you know, for me, no one else is generally going to handle our dogs. The only one that's going to ever handle our dogs on a, you know, handleable basis is going to be a vet. So that goes back to where I don't, require my dogs to be social. I'd actually oftentimes prefer that they weren't because it helps to avoid them being picked up right. um, on the side of the road type deal. But that's where it comes down to. You also need to mold your puppy to your situation. What might work for me isn't going to work for somebody else. What might work for you might not work for me. And, and that's where you really need to sit down and be honest with yourself and say, okay, here are my strengths, my weaknesses, my limitations as a trainer here's my dog's strengths and weaknesses and then how to combine all that to get the best, the best whole baked cake, I guess, you know, all those yeah. ingredients. Sure. And I think this would be a good point place to point out that, that this isn't cookie cutter training here. You know, what works on one hound is not going to work on another. Absolutely. Um, you know, I saw it a lot of times in competitive dogs with pro trainers that they might have 15, 30 dogs on a truck. And these dogs are not related. They're different owners. They've been raised differently as pups. And you see guys who can make phenomenal dogs. But those are all one type of dogs. Mm -hmm. And those type of dogs excel with that style of training. And then you've got a guy who's got the same amount of dogs, same background, but he can bring the that each individual dog to that dog's best. Yeah. And I would say it's probably more of an all around type of trainer. And that's, that's for me, what I would strive to be. I mean, I'm dang sure not there. Heck I learn stuff every day. Oftentimes it's, well, I shouldn't have done that yesterday, but I think that helps the dog more than anything. And that's where, you know, you need to be in it for the dog and, and what you, your goals are obviously important, especially for making a living with them. However, at the same time, you need to have the dog's needs first especially mentally yeah great dogs great dogs don't come along i mean the exceptional dog doesn't come along every day but the person that has a whole i mean every dog bo dog they bring out of the dog box is a very nice usable dog i've known several people that couldn't train a dog to sit that had a very talented natural type dog and then I've other seen other people that have been able to take average dogs and get great performance out of them. And to me, that person that can do that, that's the person that I'm going to learn from. And I'm going to celebrate that person. 
Absolutely. Let's um let's talk about fear periods. You lost me on that talking point when you when you sent that to me. I've never heard that, and I'm not sure what that is. So let's just let's just get it get right into that part of it. What okay. is a fear period? Um, and people call them different things. Oftentimes, the way I think it happens is puppies go through a point as they're growing up mentally. And generally, you'll see it. There's usually two or three of them. You'll generally see the first one somewhere between nine and 12 weeks. And I think what happens is they start to be more visually observant of their environment. So perfect example, um, my niece and her boyfriend over on the other side of the state, they have hounds. She's currently raising a litter. And this pup was right about that, that age period. And she's like, man, it seems like she's kind of afraid of everything. She's booger barking at strength. And this is a really well socialized dog. I mean, they take her actually to be social. They take her into town with them and do all that. Um, They have neighbors. So they, they really want her to be super people oriented. And she's like, you know, someone pulls up and she's booger barking and running around. She's seeing trash out in the hills and she's barking at it and just really like unsure. I said, just reinforce praise her. But don't don't go overboard. Just leave it alone. Do not react to her being nervous because that is a good way to make a dog more nervous because they go, oh, my God, there's validity to what I'm thinking is going on here. And it gets him more worked up. It's like a kid who falls and scrapes his knee. And if you freak out, he's going to freak out. And if you're like, oh, you won't do that again. Then, you know, generally speaking, they're going to be, oh, it's no big deal. Okay. And sure enough, about 10 days later, she goes, well, she's over that. And I think what it is is when the puppies start paying more attention to their environment. And that is when, you know, if you take that dog and start shooting over them, you're probably going to have a gun shy dog. If that puppy falls in a pool, let's say, they're going to have an aversion to water. And I think that is where some lasting habits get made. And then you'll generally see it again around that 16 week mark, give or take. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's what I've always heard them referred to as as fear periods. But I think they are more observation periods than anything. I think that's where you can have lasting trauma that affects a dog throughout their life more so than other other times in their life. So so we're not going to stop working with our dogs during that time. So would you recommend not introducing them to anything new at that point and just letting them uh, work through that naturally on their own, but just, if you're going to work on anything, then just work on some basic low key type stuff, you know, the recall, maybe a sit, you know, but just kind of back off your training a little bit and let them work through on their own. Or what do you do there? It depends on the puppy and how much it affects them. I mean, I've had some dogs that it, I mean, it borderline shut them down a little bit mentally. Um, and if that's Mm -hmm. the case, yeah, we're going to stay at home. We're going to have fun. We're going to go on walks. Um, if you have a dog that just kind of looks at stuff and is like, oh, I'm not too sure about that, yeah, we'll just keep going. And that's where they really take their their lead from you. And if you act like it's no big deal, yeah, that's cool. No, no big deal. You know, and that also goes down to, you know, we can break that down into different training methods of, you know, counter conditioning to flooding. And that, that's a whole nother podcast on its own. Um, but I think just basically read your dog, see how much it's affecting them. You're, you're going to be further ahead taking a week off and staying home. than you're going to be spending a month trying to overcome something because you're like, well, he's got to do that right now. You are not going to be that far behind letting that pup take a little bit of time off to grow up Mm there. They are still babies. You know, it's, if you think about it, especially as fast as these dogs grow, you know, eight months old, these dogs look like big dogs, generally speaking. You know, you're like, oh, yep, he's a big dog. He's ready to go. Oh, yeah. They are babies mentally. I mean, this dog is in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And and we often get ahead of ourselves on that. And, well, this dog should be doing this. Okay, but he's not. So what about it? You need to go. You need to meet your dog where he's at and adjust your expectations to where he's at at the time. It doesn't mean your end goal changes. That means how you're handling today changes. I think I think a lot of times we try to we complain a lot about anthropomorphization in our dogs and, and with animals in general, because we see the animal rights people doing that a lot, putting human behaviors in dogs. But I think it's also an easy way to, for us to draw word pictures of, of how the dog is reacting to certain things when we can draw it back and relate it to how we feel about stuff. So don't, don't mistake what I'm getting ready to say as, 
my dog is a child is a dog or is a rat, whatever you want to say there. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, but, uh, to, to draw a parallel here, you know, when my son was seven years old, which is first grader, you know, he could walk and he was, he was extremely energetic and he could walk to every tree and do everything. Well, as I saw him doing that, then I started raising my expectations of the things that he should be able to do. If you can do this then you ought to be able to do this. And if you can do this, you ought to be able to do this. And I did that to the point where I burned him out. And I see the same thing happen with, with hound pups that I've had in the past. You know, I get focused on, wow, they did that. I'm going to let them try to do that before they had this part worked out and before it was mastered instead of giving them that space to develop and and master those easy skills i started putting more pressures on them to the point where they started shutting down on me yep absolutely um you know and i i think that also at times comes back to guys who say you know fast starting dogs versus slower starters or average starters um your house isn't going to stand up if you don't put it on a solid foundation. It might stand solid for a year, and then you are going to have a whole lot of problems. And well, I'm going to take I'm, I'm going to take a big swipe right here, and uh, send all the hate mail you want. But you know things like the baby stakes in the PKC competition coon dog world has been one of the most detrimental things to our training and our development is 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 out there. Because we put these dogs in situations that they're not prepared to put them on. And I have done it. I had a very nice 11-month-old pup that I entered in the baby stakes. And I just put too much pressure on her to the point that that I had to back out. And it took me a couple months to get her over, get her over where she was at. So, you know, it, don't listen to all the chatter about what you got to have by a certain point. And if my dog wasn't doing that by this age, I'd get rid of them. That's all bull crap. You know, every dog is an individual. Absolutely. And if you think about it, generally speaking, why, why are people entering dogs and stuff like that? When we really break it down to psychology, why are people entering dogs and stuff like that? Because I want to have my picture taken at the end of the PKC baby stakes as the winner. That's why I do it. I always ask guys, it's like, can you name the, the last five years of baby stakes winners at PKC? No, no, I don't think I can. Well, then why do I want to put that kind of pressure on a dog? I'm expecting 10, 11 years of good, solid service out of this dog. And to think that I'm going to put, I would much rather have a solid finisher than an early starter. Absolutely. I, yep. And I want a dog. It's going to, he's just going to keep getting better. He's not going to be, Oh, he started great. And now he's maxed out. No, I want a dog. That's, you know, he's in his prime prime at four or five years old. He's still just getting better. And it's not because he's a dud. It's because he's still building on everything he's got. I don't want a dog that's 16 months. It's like, well, that's what he is. And that's what I got for the next nine years. Well, exactly. okay, you know, and that's, I mean, everybody to their own, everybody's situation is going to be different. Everybody's dogs are different and that's, that's fine. It's not right or wrong, but you got to take the dog into the equation. You know, if you think about it, these dogs are really at our mercy. They don't get a say in anything in their life, except if they want to bark or not, basically big holes. Right. So we need to make sure that we're looking at it from the dog's perspective too. And what's going to be best for him? What's going to help him be his best? And how do we ensure we do that? I mean, are we just going to walk through here and, and I, like we've said before, it's no cookie cutter. And I think when we do these podcasts like this, just like the aggression deal, there are a lot of questions that go unanswered because there are no, solid answers for every situation it's not a deal where you can you can put a question and on facebook and expect the right answer you know what i mean and now i think you could take that pup to a professional trainer or have a relationship with someone who is a very good trainer and be totally open it open and honest about what's going on and they can walk you through some steps to be successful but in our current world, 
what does everybody do? I've got a dog that is puking in the dog box. What do I need to do? And then the answers start coming in, you know? Good, bad, or indifferent. They start exactly. coming in. And that's where, you know, and I, I always tell people, hey, you know, if you've got a question, message me on Facebook, text me, whatever. I don't have any problem uh, trying to answer that. But I'm also going to tell you, hey, this is going to depend on your dog and your situation. Like we've gone into, you know, what's going to ruin one dog is going to make another. And that's where we have to really sit down and consider ourselves and say, okay, this is my weakness here. So maybe I need another set of eyes. And that's whether it's hounds, bird dogs, border collies, sled dogs, whatever. You know, and don't be afraid to call up a professional trainer if you're really having trouble and say, hey, can I, can we do a session together? Or if you've got someone, you know, if you've got a mentor that's helping you with your hounds, hey, can we go out for a day out in the field? And I want your opinion before I... I do this. I want your opinion on what's happening. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. It could save you a whole lot of trouble or you might say, okay, yeah, I'm on the right track. I actually may have a little bit of an idea of what I'm doing. I haven't reached that point yet, but hopefully someday before I die. Yeah. One of the things that I would caution people of anytime you get advice from somebody who, who you consider reputable or credible, they should be asking you a lot of questions before they answer your question. You know, if you put it out there on Facebook, you're going to get a hundred opinions, but a person should be, if you're really wanting to get advice, they should be asking you a lot of questions, you know, things about, you know, how was the dog handled in that situation in the past? What kind of reactions have you seen from in the past? What have you done to correct that in the past? And, and they should walk through a lot, ask a lot of questions before they ever give you an opinion of how to fix your problem. Absolutely. And that's how we're so lucky with technology. You know, we've got a video camera in our pockets. Say, so, hey, send me a video. Show me because, you know, you might think your dog is being OK. He's being aggressive for this reason. Well, let me see his body language. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is what's going on. And here's why. And here's what you need to do to fix it. You know, so so really take advantage of everything you've got. And we've got, you know, the world's knowledge and theory at our fingertips, even if you can pick up some books that aren't on hounds dogs are dogs the psychology is the same behind them it's it's edited to your purpose but if you can really get in there and understand the way a dog's mind works and start establishing good habits before before you let bad ones come in because you are literally building the partner that you're going to spend in theory the next five eight ten years with depending on what you do with your dogs, you know, and they can be a barn burner out in the hills. You still got to live with them on days off and you still got to live with them 12 hours a day when you're not hunting. And there's a lot of habits that uh, a good hunting dog won't overcome at home. And you want to yeah. set that dog up to be his best. So no matter where he goes, he's appreciated and he's enjoyed. That's what I've tried to do with this podcast is try to try to, take things that are transferable from, you know, a guy like Keith Hyatt, a police working dog trainer, you know, having you on here, who has been a bird dog trainer, Jared Moss has been on before. He's a bird dog trainer. We, we talked to all these different people, not solely to prop people up as experts on hounds, but every subject matter expert, I know, I don't care if it's training horses, you know, subject matter experts, if you're a quarter horse trainer, then you, you have talked to people who, who are racetrack, racetrack breeders or trainers. You've talked to people that are cutting horse trainers. You've talked to people that are roping horse trainers and you bring all that home to what you're specifically trying to do and gathering all that information and putting laser focus on it into this dog. The horse is a horse is a horse, and a, a dog is the same, whether it's a it's a beagle, a blue tick, a malinois, the way they learn, the things that they, the way their brains work, they're basically the same. And we can glean all this information from this big dog world and make us all better trainers and make us happier hunters. Absolutely, and that's where I think the houndsmen, in a way, are maybe at a little bit of a disadvantage uh, because it is such a... I don't want to say hands off style of training, but it, it really is at times, you know, you're not there 
putting rock solid, just little tiny particles being changed of obedience on a dog. You're not there when he's 800 yards out in the woods. You can't see the stuff you can see on, say, a bird dog or a Shutson dog or anything like right. that. Um, so that's where I think they can benefit from that type of knowledge also and say, okay, well, this is how it applies to me. You know, for me, when my little guys are eight weeks old and they are starting to have some brain cells connecting and, and they're able to to retain a little bit of stuff, you know, I don't want them jumping on the kennel door to get out. I'll wait, and it may only be a split second, but I'll wait until everybody's feet are on the ground, then the kennel door opens. It's little daily habits like that. You don't have to fix problems you don't let get started. It's a whole lot easier to establish good habits than bad habits, and no matter what you're doing, you are affecting that dog every time you handle them, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, you know, and that's where I'll do little stuff. If I've got a dog that I've got a litter right now, the female acts like she's been hunting for 20 years and she she's basically a big dog in a little dog body. Her litter mate is still the typical and, and nobody shoot the messenger here. Um, females just tend to mature faster mentally than males do. I mean, and that's in about everything. Um, You're being anthropomorphic again. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Uh, well, you didn't say feminist, so I'm, I'm okay with anthropomorphism. Um, but, you know, the male is the typical kind of goofy. He's still wanting loves and pats and attention, and he's he's jumping in front of the side-by-side -side and snoofing for snacks. And what are we going to do here? You know, where the sister, man, she's about on the payroll practically. So when she comes back, you know, and she's checking in, I might pet her a little bit. Yeah, you're doing good. You know, a little bit of confidence boost and off she goes again. That male, I won't necessarily interact with as much out in the field because I want him to think I'm boring. I don't want him hanging out with me. I want him going with the other dogs. So if we're hiking and he's just on my heels, I'll stop and stand there and completely ignore him. And then he's going to mm -hmm. go, well, you know, he might sniff around for a minute or two and they go, all right, well, there's nothing going on here, but those dogs over there are having fun and doing something. I'm going to go see what they're doing. That's when I'll resume. So some of it isn't necessarily conscious on their part. It's conscious on your part. Absolutely. It's uh, one of those deals. I've, as a professional trainer in the canine world, a lot of times, you know, you, you get new handlers that want to praise their dog for every thing that they do. Uh, because let me see how I want to lay this out. Some dogs don't need as much praise as other dogs. And you mentioned, you, you nailed it right there, Becky. Um, some dogs need a little more praise. Sometimes you got to cap that energy. And if you're feeding that bad habit with praise, then, then obviously you're, that's the obvious thing. But if a dog is very energetic at a tree, you know, trees, trees by themselves. Um, and you can, you, if you walk into that tree and you're like, wow, look at that pup tree and on that tree, that dog doesn't need a lot of praise from you. You know, you go in there and you start praising him, you get him jacked up and, and amped up. Then you can turn that into misdirected energy towards other bad habits. So you've got, you've got to read your dog, your individual dog of what they need. Absolutely. And then, you know, a lot of it with the hounds, the self-rewarding, um, you know, something that sort of to go back to that swagger dog that I was saying, you know, his escape and his avoidance is itching his collar. And that's all, you know, his release is just shaking after after a situation, you know, just shaking it off. Basically, he did not. He's coming around really well. Um, he did not have a lot of self-confidence at all. And his brother did. His brother's a rock star. This is a slower starting dog. He wanted to go along, but he's very sensitive. And he just didn't have the self-confidence to just go out there and make decisions. So what does Cleve start doing when he has a track that he's going to turn out on? Swagger gets kicked out first to where it's his track and he found it and he's the starter. And that has made such a world of difference. And it's little things like little, just little habits and little changes you can make that can make a world of difference. It'd be like, you know, an uncle and cousin or an uncle and nephew wrestling around. Well, obviously a 10 year old isn't going to be able to whip a 30 year old, but he's going to let that kid win. And he, that kid's going to walk around, you know, he's going to be swinging yeah. Connor McGregor arms walking through the house. <laughs> and it's the same thing with puppies. Now 
you can also get a dog that's too confident doing that also. And there's times where they get a little big for their britches and nope, you, you need to get knocked down a peg or two. And that's something where an old dog can help a lot, depending on the situation. Sometimes if the behavioral thing, a lot of my older dogs will correct some bad behaviors. I have uh, an old dog now who's kind of my right hand man. And if I have a group of dogs that, you know, just running here around the place, let's say, that can have maybe some social tension or th there could be the possibility of a situation escalating. Generally, he's over there correcting it before I am if they're a ways over. And I just kind of watch and he's very, very good about it. He's really good about if puppies are pestering older dogs um, or are just not kind of getting basic manners and how to communicate with other dogs. He's really, really good at correcting that. And he's extremely judicial about it. He doesn't go overboard. He doesn't hurt him. He just knocks him down a little bit and is like, hey, that's enough. Yeah. And then they will generally come back apologetic. They'll be licking the muzzle. They'll have their tail lowered. It's good to go again. I think a lot of people get caught up also in, you know, I'm going to treat my dog like another dog would. You know, you see that a lot of times with alpha rolls, someone grabbing a dog and, you know, rolling him on his back and kind of in his face a little bit. And, and I'm, you see that in certain circles. Um, my dog knows I'm not another dog. However, yeah. at the same time, I'm going to communicate like another dog because that's what he understands. But there is a difference there. I agree. You know, we're not dogs. And a lot of times that's why the, the, the gang line, you know, strung out there and watching other dogs do their job can be so beneficial. Becky, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that is so amazing about hounds and you brought it up a few times, we are doing something with, with our hounds and our dogs that is completely different than me sitting in a duck blind with a, a lab and expecting to go out 200 yards and bring it back. That dog's under my sight and my control all the time. If I'm hunting German short hairs, you know, they're, they're line of sight. We're expecting these dogs to perform. A lot of times, the last time we see them is when we, they, they drop over the side of a hill into the brush and we don't see them again until they're caught and everything between then and the tree or the bay up, man, that's, that's their job. And that's what is so cool about what we do and so misunderstood about what we do is there. It's the most difficult thing that you can ask a dog to do. Really. I, I believe, you know, even police canine stuff was not at this level where dogs are expected to perform without, without me being there. Absolutely. Um, you know, they're kind of not self-employed, but in a way they are. And that's part of why with those puppies, I, I want them to be confident in me, but I want them to have their own self-confidence. And that's where you build that as puppies, exposing them to new situations, you know, like the pool we were talking about and then realizing, you know, at first it's a little scary. And then once they get out of it and you watch when these puppies overcome things, you know, I'll take them out in the hills and they'll be falling off logs or climbing up boulders and when they get to it, you can see their chest kind of puffs out a little bit. And they're like, I kind of got it going on. I got through that. It was a little scary. But now I'm, yeah. I'm kind of cool, you know. And that's so good for puppies. And it makes it – it's so much easier to tone down um, driving a dog than it is to build it. And it's so easy to build it when they're little. They're, they're just little sponges. You can do so much with them before that six-month mark. And that really sets them up for the rest of their life. I mean, of course, you know, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, yeah, you can, but it's a whole lot harder. Right. It's just learning comes so natural to them at that age. And it, it's really just, it's so much easier to take advantage of it then. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is always our best performing podcast and our most listened to podcasts are when we cover topics just like this. You know, people, people want to know. They want information. They want to learn. They want to do the best thing for their for their hound. They want to give them the best start. And we just scratched the surface in this podcast with how to get those puppies off on the right foot. And I probably didn't do the best of moderating through this whole thing. 
Uh, we are experiencing a little bit of lag in our communication here and stuff, but I think it'll be all right. And uh, I think we've we've laid down a foundation to build on Becky on on uh, this puppy kindergarten uh, topic that you started off this whole conversation with that we started developing here. So let's give them some takeaways, some ta- some some final thoughts and takeaways that you would want everybody that gets that seven or eight week old puppy what it what are the the main takeaways from becky dwyer for success start good habits instead of letting bad ones develop you have to fix meet the dog where he's at and adjust yourself to the dog that doesn't mean you don't let the dog grow the dog needs to be pushed out of his comfort zone to an extent in order to grow um You know, when you're working with obedience, make sure you end on something easy, especially if you've had a tough training session, a dog's having a hard time really getting something, bring them back to something they know as simple as a sit and they can excel at and they finish it like, yeah, that was great. I want to do that again. Um, You know, just really do everything you can with them. Let them, let them get out there and maybe fall off a log within, you know, within reason, of course, but let the pups get out and live and experience stuff. And really look at yourself, too, and say, what can I do to improve the way I communicate to this dog and and build a good foundation that just makes it a whole lot easier and a whole lot more enjoyable to be around them. And don't get caught up in what somebody else wants for their dog. They're not feeding your dog. They're not handling them. They're not living with them on a daily basis. Something that works for me or you might not work for somebody else and vice versa. And just really do everything you can to help them out, especially in that zero to six month range. It just makes life a whole lot easier. Yeah. One of the biggest lessons that I'm still learning, uh, is, you know, checking that ego. It's not about, it's not about me. It's about this dog. And, and I always, I always like that saying that let your dogs do your talking for you, you know, you do your part. Don't worry about it, about your egos and things like that. Or like you said, what other people are doing, uh, just develop your skills based on, on your abilities. It's a learning process from, for the puppy, from the time that puppy until he's dead. And it's also, also our learning experience, our learning growth, uh, a journey for us as houndsmen there are always things to learn out there and always ways to improve our game. And that's what the, that's what we try to do here every week is give people the tools to uh, improve their game. Absolutely. You know, it's amazing what five minutes a day can do. You can have a, yeah. you can have a pup that is just a joy to be around in five minutes a day and just I make agree. sure you leave them, I you agree. leave them wanting more and don't over, don't overwork their attention span. You can always go yep. back and do more, but you can't do less after you've earned something out. Yep. All right. Well, hey, I think that's a good place to end this episode. And uh, Becky, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. Well, until next time, you follow your hounds and I'll follow mine. Sounds like a plan.